Between the kids being home and hosting, everything in our house gets used up in summer. With Instacart, I can save money by stocking up on all my favorite summer brands. I save time by getting everything delivered in as fast as an hour. And I save myself a sink full of dirty dishes by stocking up on paper plates for the annual summer cookout. Save more on summer essentials? Spend more time enjoying summer. Add summer to cart. Download the app to get free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum $10 per order. Additional terms apply. Empire. Hello and welcome to my live stream edition of the John Conn Report. Appreciate you tuning in. Don't forget, you can always find us on anywhere you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, all these good points. If you want to follow us on YouTube, go to Empire Media. That's A-M-P-I-R-E. Always much appreciated when you tune in. And of course, you can read my work on ESPN.com. I have a story up now about Sam Howell's first game, where, where it looked good, where it needed to improve. So, as you can see, I'm joined tonight by the voice of the Washington Commanders, Bram Weinstein, my good pal. So, what I want to do, is, Bram, is just talk for a few minutes, then answer a few questions about the first game and where you think things are headed. And I've had a chance to talk a lot to this group about what my thoughts were. And, in fact, earlier today put up a little bit of a film review about the sacks, about Sam Howell's day, then after the game. So, I am curious, Bram, from your perspective, what were some of your big takeaways from the opener? Boy, where do you want to start? Let's start with, let's start with the offensive line. Cause that's a big one. And one of the things, okay. and just so, you know, I know you, you know, you put it up this morning, but my take was, first of all, the line has to get better. We know that. And I think it has to get better in multiple facets. Not all the six sacks were on them. And I think there were some areas where people thought that certain players were just horrible, horrible, horrible. And the film did not support that narrative. So I am curious what you thought about the line. Um, you know, uh, I say this, we say this every year, and I feel this way about this particular game. It's, it's not as bad as, it, as I thought it was when I left the stadium. Oftentimes, you know, when they have a big win, it's not as good as you think it is. So re-watching last night was really eye-opening for me. Um, and I want to start by saying this, because I think a lot of this conversation needs to be couched on let's be honest about the team that they played here. Right, like that, right, That's right. not a great roster. So on both sides of the ball, when we talk about it, I mean, I want to be, I want to be diplomatic about it because I don't want to rip another team, but like that, that is, I mean, I think most people would agree with me that that is a bottom tier roster that's out on in the yes. NFL this year. So with that in mind, um, I actually thought the offensive line played better than it probably seemed. Um, the person I think who stood that's out a fair way to put it. Yeah. Yes. I, you know, like w when you hear three turnovers, six sacks, like it sounds 238 yards, it sounds really bad. Um, and, uh, yes, uh, Ryan, I, I still am in my secret bunker. We're still in the midst of, <laughs> we're still, at, for those of you watching, sorry, but my house is under construction. So I've been sequestered to this little hole. Hopefully in the next couple of weeks, I'll be back in like a normal area again. Um, and not being held, uh, against my will. All right. Um, I thought Sam Cosby was outstanding. So from yes. a first impression of his move to right guard, um, he got off blocks, got to the second level, was extremely aggressive. I thought he did a very, very good job. Nick Gates is everything I thought he'd be very aggressive. I did think there was some miscommunication in the center of the line with him. Um, but overall, I thought he was very good. Sadiq Charles, I thought, was very aggressive, very good, with the exception of one particular drive um, where there was one play where I thought he hurt his knee because he had got kind of bent over. Um, it doesn't sound like that happened, but it didn't look good. So there was a couple plays there. I thought Charles Leno was fine. You know, I really did. And Andrew Wiley had a few moments for sure. And the the part that really stands out to me, there's two things about it that stands out to me. And and there's a secondary part to this second part, and then I'll shut up and let you talk. Um, when the Cardinals put six up on the line and feigned like they were going to bring heat, and they didn't do it very often. But when they did, there was confusion on the offensive line as to who was where. So the double whammy of the sack fumble touchdown was a miscommunication of who had Dennis Gardeck, who, by the way, is a very underrated, very good pass rusher, like Hassan Redicki style. Maybe not as consistent, but very, very good pass rusher. He's one of, if not the only outside of Buda Baker, dangerous player on that defense. And he made a huge play in that moment. But it was because of a miscommunication and a miss. So he gets through. Hal had to get rid of the ball. Double whammy on that play. Hal had to make up for the mistake. There was a mistake on the line. So double whammy, it happens. 
Um, but outside, and this is why I can't believe Arizona didn't do more of it. A couple of their sacks came on this. Like they caught them off guard and there were miscommunications. Um, they didn't do enough of it, in my opinion. I think if they rewatch how they play defense, the fact that they used in these looks where they, you don't know how many people they're bringing and still confuse them by only bringing four, I think they're going to look back on this and think that they didn't do enough up front to try to confuse this offensive line. On the good side, um, I thought they ran the ball better than it looks. And the thing that's noticeable is because it was not happening last year because we didn't have the players to do it was the movement and the pulling of the interior line, specifically Cosme and Gates or Sadiq and Gates, or at times Wiley too, the athleticism was obviously there. So I actually saw some pretty good creases for the run game. Now, they didn't exploit many of them. And then lastly on that, this is where I was surprised by how they handled, not only did they run the ball three times in a row when they got the ball to 22 and really could have put them away at the end of the game, but style of run, which was just line up power, dive across the middle, and not use the the type of formations and run fits that seemed to be working earlier in the game. So not only was it not aggressive at the end of the game, it was not aggressive without using the plays that were working in their run game. So that that's my that's my overall take, like on the offensive line. Yeah, and I I think what we saw from the line, and you know, it's funny because sometimes things get if you say a guy wasn't like Wiley had. There were two plays. He had the, the sack fumble. That was his. Then he had a holding penalty that was also, that was obviously his. Otherwise in protection, he was fine, right? Because there you didn't see the issues coming from there. Like there was one time there was a slide protection that was missed. That was Gates had to slide over. Yeah. Um, I thought there was some inconsistencies in the run game. I thought Sadiq at times was a little bit inconsistent there. Um, but some of the stuff, you know, you like this is where you don't know, and this is where I'll say, okay, let's see, because he is, even though he's experienced, he's not necessarily an experienced starter enough. He's got. Let's see how he is when he got has a few games under. But the question I would ask too is, while it wasn't as bad as I think people thought, maybe it was, and and again, like I would say for anybody who feels like that, like the reason I'm saying this and the reason Graham is it. saying this, yeah, I'm like somebody Rewatch asked it. me. Rush Manuel, you know, my, my our guy on Twitter was asked he couldn't join tonight, but he asked me, like, what do you do when you rewatch the game? So when I rewatch, and just so people know where it's coming from, and first of all, like I also talk to people who are much smarter than me about what they saw as well, just to see am I seeing it right. But what I'll do, Bram, is my little thing is I'm gonna watch every play, especially if there's like a sack the sacks or just even the pass plays it's probably about eight to time and eight to 10 times per play that you're watching, you're slowing it down from, and you get it from multiple angles from the end zone, from the sideline. And just, and then, so I can see what was this person doing on this play. And if I don't see what they're doing, then I go back and watch again. So, and there's some plays where you're like, okay, you can, you see right away, this is what happened. And then you go, but some of those you want to see like, why did this person react this way? So you're going to spend several hours. Like I'll get up Monday morning. It's by, by 6 a.m. I'm in my office, sometimes by 5.30, watching this stuff again and then going over it and over it and over it. So just so people understand the process, it's not just after a game sitting down and saying, boy, that looked horrible. So I think it was horrible. It's like, boy, that didn't look great. Let's see how it looked on film. Yes, That's what it is. So you try to strip away the passion side of me. And like, trust me, folks, I'm an Ohio State guy. You see the hat. There are a lot of times after a game that I'm thinking exactly like how you guys are thinking now. That's how I think about how some of the Ohio State games I see. And then you watching it, oh, it wasn't quite as bad as I thought. Anyways, just that's just for people understand to understand the process that we put into it. And yeah. what, you know, for you, Bram, I mean, I'm assuming it's the same thing. Yeah, I, I'd like I I watch it on the all twenty two because that that's right. the best way for me to rewatch it. Right. And uh, they give you multiple angles, you know, for the all twenty two, and then. You know, I'll watch, you know, specific plays four, five, six, seven times, uh, you know, to see what happened because you can't catch every position. So, no. you know, it takes a while to go over it, but it's worth it in the end, in my opinion. It's worth yes, it. Yes, very I mean, much. To do this job and to do it, you know, to do it to the best of my ability. I'm like you. Um, I form my opinions and then go ask questions about whether my opinions right. are valid or not. But, you know, I, I, I describe it as I've learned through osmos osmosis through the years that, like, you know, having talked to coaches through the years, having watched film, um, and, and I, I feel like I know enough and most of the time, you know, I'm, I'm on the right path, but oftentimes they'll, they'll tell me where, where we're a little bit off, but overall, I mean, that's where I landed on the offensive line. 
the metrics don't look good. The numbers don't look particularly no. good. And and I'll give you another one that, that I really didn't like. They didn't have a single run over 10 yards. The, the no, long that, run that's something yards. I want to ask. So, yeah. so that, that, that's, that's something that clearly has to change. And it goes right. back to there were creases and holes that were created by them, you know, so, but we didn't have a running back that was able to plow through and, and make a bigger play than he did. I saw some blocks you know, miss at the second level too, yeah. or not sustained as well. Right. And so there, you yeah. know, in some cases like, and this is where like, you know, a guy like Charles versus Chris Paul, Chris Paul, is a little bit stronger at the point of attack, but Charles moves better. And so like, you, know, you wish you could kind of combine the two, but you can't. But anyway, so I'm sorry, go ahead. I had heard before the game that Antonio Gibson was going to get more reps than he did. I think the fumble, and I don't know this for sure, I'd have to ask the coaches about it, but I do think the fumble probably changed their mind about that. So, you know, I'll have to ask them about this, but I, I had gotten the word that he was going to, because of matchups that they liked, that he was going to get more time on the field. And um, the fact that he ended up only getting three carries and one catch on one target probably has a little bit to do with ball security. And, um, you know, it, I, but I, that's, you know, educated guess on that one. Having right. been told what to expect before we walked into the game, that you'd see more of a, a shared load between him and Gibson, and that it didn't end up that way. The only thing I can really attribute it to was a fumble. Right. And I think, you know, it's funny because you talk about the long runs and I'm watching some other games around the league and you see like, oh, do they have that kind of a back? And I'm, I like Brian Robinson, you know, and I, I think he can be a good solid back. He's not a dynamic runner. He's a powerful runner between the tackles. But what I also wonder too, is do you have, you know, if you don't have that dynamic runner, you better have guys that can open things up at the second level to help create that third level situation where you can make a guy miss. And now you turn a 10 yard run into 20 yards. That's what I wonder about with this line is, do they have, do can, are they able to do that? And it's not just line. There are some blocks, like there are a couple of blocks where I saw, I took a, I took a video of one play and I may post it on Instagram tomorrow where it's the inside, inside the um, red zone where like Bates just buries some guys and like the yep. le the left side, the right side, just caused me. I think Sadiq got Sadiq, Sadiq basically bear hugged a guy on yep. this. And, you know, but, but it was just like a good, powerful run in the red zone. And, you know, those are things that like, you know, so Bates getting involved. Cause when, and when I talk about protection, Bram too, it's protection. And then when you talk to coaches, when they talk about protection, which is why I take this approach, it's it's not just the O-line, it's the tight ends. It's a quarterback diagnosing things at the proper pace, right? And it's also receivers have to win their routes at the right, at, uh, on time. And so, because it all works together. If you're not winning on time, the guy can't get rid of the ball. Now he's got to hold it. And now you have problems if it breaks down. And so, but I also wonder, Bram, too, when you look, when you go forward, like the line wasn't as bad as we thought Sunday. But was it good enough to get this team like against a, some better defenses coming up? That is really the question, and that's something I don't know yet. Yeah, I mean, I think this weekend's going to be very telling. You know, I mean, yeah. like, it's the better defense that they're facing this weekend with Denver, and it's on the road, so this will be very telling. What happens this week? Um, I see a number of people saying like, you know, they, they need time to gel. I agree with this. I like, agree with that really absolutely. Is, it's really a new line, you know, and when we get to Sam, I got to tell you, I mean, I'll just tell you up front, like I actually thought he played a lot better than I thought he did. You know, like like. <laughs> He was actually everything I kind of expected from him, albeit with a few massive mistakes that occurred. And there's the growing pains that are come with this. But with the offensive line, largely, I came out of it thinking they didn't play very well because you see six sacks and you see things like that. And you're like, that's bad. And then I rewatched and I go, I don't think they actually played that poorly. And I will say this largely, too, because the defense, it goes without saying the defense was dominant right against them. Um, they were actually dominant on the offensive side of the ball too it was their own mistakes that got in their own way i mean re really honestly like the fact the numbers to me after re-watching don't really reflect how effective they actually were they got in their own way with bad penalties uh miscommunications on the line and in a couple of cases a couple of bad breaks like they had a logan thomas play down the sideline taken back on a terrible call like there so there were a couple of things that kind of you know did not go their way that were a little bit unfortunate NFL Sunday Ticket is now on YouTube and YouTube TV, which means that you can stay close to your team even if you don't live in their town. Like, maybe you're a Raven who married a Seahawk who got a job in the land of the Falcons. With NFL Sunday Ticket, you can watch your team's out-of-market Sunday afternoon games no matter where you live because you shouldn't have to change teams even if you change towns. NFL Sunday Ticket, now on YouTube and YouTube TV. Go to youtube.com slash presale to get $50 off. 
Terms and embargoes apply. Offer ends 919. No refunds. Subscription auto renews. What's up? It's Kaylee Cuoco. When it comes to travel, we all have a happy place. I just went to my happy place. I just went to Maui, and it was truly amazing. Priceline has always been about getting you to your happy place for a happy price with deals you really can't find anywhere else, like up to 60% off select hotels in Costa Rica or five-star hotels for two-star prices in Cabo. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Football is back in full swing with another week of epic games. And who's got you covered on the action for every single one of them? DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. New customers can bet $5 on football and get $200 instantly in bonus bets. Nobody's missing out on the action this season. All DraftKings customers can take advantage of two new offers every game day this September. Get in on the NFL Week 2 action with DraftKings Sportsbook. Download the app now and use code KIM, K-E-I-M to sign up. New customers can bet just $5 and take home $200 instantly in bonus bets. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code KIME. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. See sportsbook.draftkings.com slash football terms for eligibility, terms, and responsible gaming resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Eligibility and deposit restrictions apply. Right, and, and, and I'm with you on how, and I talked about this earlier today, so I don't want to waste time you know, just kind of saying the same thing, but I did think he was better. Like, there's there's a lot of things that I still like with him, and they're, you know, I, I just, I love the competitiveness, and I even said on my pod on, earlier today, but also um, on the radio that I felt like it was almost a little bit of a Heineke-esque type game where you find a way to win. Now he's more talented than Taylor, but it was, but I think he brings some of that same mentality, which is, you know, he's very competitive and he doesn't let the bad play, the bad series or plays get to him. And I love that. And I think that's something you can absolutely build off of. And you have to remember like, it's his second start, you know, like, you know, somebody Johnny, asked, he had a handful of bad throws the whole game. Yeah. Like now, right, we could parse out whether he made the right decisions on certain right, things. Right. Right. But like he had a hand, like he had two plays early. I think it was after one of the early sacks. He had two that he forced like two in a row that he forced that were bad. He sailed one on Jahan. That was bad footwork, frankly. And then there right. was one play where he had a wide receiver screen set up. And I don't know why he didn't throw it. He just didn't throw it. And he took off and ran. And, and so I'd have to ask him, why did you do that one, yeah. in that particular case? And then he forced one to Logan that was late. But then yeah. think about the other throws. He had a couple of drops, like flat drops by Logan. That ball that like, Curtis Samuel was beautiful at the yes, end of the first he had, half. He that was like, freaking that, great. That to, me, to me, like well, outside of the sweat plays and the defensive play, the sweat plays really turned the game, obviously. The play of the game offensively was – he just got a sack fumble that gave Arizona the lead with 55 seconds to go in the game, turns around and throws two dots and then an incredible pass to Curtis Samuel. And frankly, might have had a touchdown had he shot for Jahan behind him. So, like, he had two open receivers. He passed to Samuel, set up a field goal at the end of the half. This guy has done this over and over. It, you know, one, he's the most accurate passer we've had since Kirk, since Kirk Cousins here. It translated into week one. I know the numbers don't say it, but I'm telling you it like, if you rewatch this, you'll see it. It was right there. If you take away the flat drops that occurred to him, he's got a 66 something percentage of completions out there. And then it's this, he doesn't stack up the bad plays. He comes back. He has what is a disaster play at the end of a half has barely any time left in a timeout. And he throws a dot to Samuel that sets up a field goal. That's winning football. I mean, like, I know nobody likes what the score was. I thought they should have won by more. In rewatching, you felt like the better team was, it wasn't even close who the better team actually was. And the score is not indicative of who the better team was. However, they won. And I, I keep trying to remind myself here, like, not everything was great about this. There's a lot to clean up here. There were some massive mistakes, but the Rams went to Seattle and killed them. The Giants, that was an abominable performance by them. Like the Bengals had a terrible performance in week one. This could have happened to them too. Don't get it twisted. This could have happened to them too. And it was right. very close to happening and they found a way to win anyway. No, absolutely. And by the way, on the one play you're talking about the screen, 
So that was an RPO. And this is something else I talked about, but I know this, that on that one, he hesitated to Terry. And they said, if you see it go, but the, what was happening is the outside linebacker, he's reading that and he sees him start to hedge his way to the outside. And that's why he tucked him run. But they said, just throw, because Terry would have gotten four yards on that anyways. But you look at that, that's an RPO handoff is what he should have done. And so like, that's, so the learning curve, but, but the whole learning curve, everything's a lesson still for him. So in that situation, it's like, okay, you made the decision to throw, then throw it, let him get the three or four yards, but it's better than zero, which is what he got, which counted as a sack. So yeah. anyway, so let me ask you this too, because we, we've talked a lot about, about him, but you know, defensively, and I know that, I know that, you know, Arizona's offense is not very good. But what? But that defensive line was tremendous, and yeah. it wasn't just like the one thing that really jumped out to me was it wasn't just Deron Payne or Montez Sweat. John Allen made a lot of noise, <laughs> you know. But it was also I thought James with Williams played really well. Very I thought well. Casey Tillhill did a nice job. Abdullah Anderson made a couple plays. Yeah. So it was it was a lot of guys contributed up there. But like there were a couple plays where Montez Sweat is like, dude is just really athletic, and so he gets one and a half sacks. So what do we always talk about him finishing, him finishing? And the thing that, you know, within that game, like it's always hand in hand coverage into that. Well, his sacks did not come fast. Like I think one of them was three point something seconds. The other one was around four and a half seconds. Yeah. But it gave, but they covered well enough to give him time to get around the corner. And, and that's, and one time was a fumble. So, you know, I thought, I thought the line was, tr was tremendous. John Allen and Deron Payne, uh, Payne, first of all, came back what looks to be in better shape and faster than he did a year ago. And there's one play you want to go watch like something crazy. He gets double teamed on a play. They throw a screen pass. He breaks off of it and makes a tackle 10 yards yes. downfield. Yeah. You know, like he, and he's John Allen it's cartoonish at times what he does to offensive linemen. When he times the snap right, he's got this move where he cuts through the center and the guard, and it's impossible to stop. And within half a second, he's in the quarterback's face. There was another one. I don't know if you saw this one. There's another one where the guard somehow got turned around where he was facing his own quarterback, and Allen was pushing him towards him. I mean, there's like yeah. these cartoonish moments with oh. these two. They are in an unbelievably great tandem. Um, oh, and swept, like, yeah, I mean, to your point, they've been saying this, listen, he doesn't, you don't even need to say it out loud. Um, they told Deron Payne, have a big year, have big numbers. We'll pay you. They did. They told John Allen to do the same thing. They did. They've told McClure to do the same. Dick McClure might be a little different because, you know, of his, what his meaning is to the organization. I don't think they told him you have to have 1500 yards receiving, but they, you know, they want to see production. Would you look with Montez sweat? The, he's basically saying, do what those other two guys did. We'll pay you. Now, we don't know if the new owners follow through with that promise the way Rivera followed through with the previous promises, but the but the record is there for him to look back on and his agent to look back on that they do pay their own when they do perform. And this was a hell of a start for him. And the other one, too, and we'll, I'm sure we'll get to it, Cam Curl was a pro bowler two days ago. He was... He oh, was, Cam was great. <laughs> it's he so was ridiculously anticipatory of plays. He was in people's yes. face. It was, yep. he knew where the ball, I don't know. I don't think Arizona knew where the ball was going because if a quarterback has been there for two weeks, Cam standing where the receivers were expected to be on seven to eight different occasions. Yeah. I mean, he, he is at times the linchpin of their defense and he was absolutely outstanding. There were, he had the play inside in the red zone where he, he almost picked it off, but it's just a, he, he got, got his heels on the goal line and he drove on the ball. It was just really good play. And then there were a couple other times where, yeah. you know, because they're using him in the box a lot, is that is it hybrid in the Buffalo nickel roll, where what I love about him is he's not, not a huge guy, no problem sticking his nose in there. And he got in there a couple of times where he just, he's able to avoid blocks, but he is, he is really aggressive getting to where he needs to be. And I think he is such an asset yeah. to that defense. And the one thing I'd like to see him add to his game is exactly what he almost did the other day, which is, pick off a couple passes because that will get him more recognition and it'll get him paid more. So that, which is the one missing part to his resume. He is really, really good. And you know, I've always appreciated oh, how much he was, plays his spot. I, I think I even said it on the air, I go for, for week one, for two guys in a, in contract years, that was a hell of a first impression that they went to make. I mean, they looked like players and here's the way that they played. And the other thing that really stood out to me on defense for sure is 
Um, and and I we saw the shot the spring and into the summer, which got me very excited about the defense. The speed on the back end is there. You want to see something else that was laughable. Like when you rewatch, you'll see the John Allen play, which is amazing. As a guy literally facing his quarterback, he's hand, backwards, he's pushing him backwards. I don't even know how it happened. There is a play. You're like you remember Percy Butler nearly had an interception. Yeah. They could add three interceptions yeah. this team. Forbes could add one late. Yeah. Curl could add one. Percy could add one. Right. So they could add five turnovers easily in this game. But they did. The Percy Butler one. Go rewatch this. As the ball is being snapped, Percy Butler is looking the other direction at his teammate, asking him a question. Probably, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Who yep. man do I have? Yeah, it was up at the and line, right on the right the side. Ball, he's on the line yeah. of scrimmage yep, when yep, the yep. ball is snapped. He's looking at his teammate, asking him a question about something. The ball is snapped, and he recovers and nearly picks off a ball yep. seven yep. yards yep. behind yep. him. Yeah, no, that was because there was like speed. a little stack formation to the left of the offense, right there. Yep, that's speed. They yeah, have no, no, no. a level of speed on the back end that they have not had for a very long time. And again, I want to be diplomatic about this. That is not a good offense that they face. That is not a very good offensive line. There's very few receivers there that scare you. The quarterback's been there for two weeks and is a career backup. Like, I want to be fair about this. They right. didn't dominate the Chiefs, you know, the other day. But they did what they're supposed to do against a team that should be overmatched against them. And there were... They easily could have had a ton of turnovers. They limited them. And I think I counted, I don't know, maybe seven plays that were true positive plays by this team that were not just short dump off three yard, whatever. Like they had a couple nice rushes on the edge. They had a nice play early in the second after Rondell Moore, where there was a really bad hold that was missed on Jamin Davis. I don't know whether that would have been called back or, you know, I don't know whether he would have gotten there or not and changed the outcome, but there was a hold, a bad one that was missed on Davis on that play. Um, There were very, very, very few, what I would describe as positive and anything close to a chunk play against them. I mean, you can't ask for much more than that. And then when you need them to make a play because the offense is struggling, they do. So this is winning football. I know it was ugly. It wasn't exactly what I expected either. I thought they would blow this team out, frankly. And if you rewatch, you see the earmarks of they should have. They just didn't. They didn't. And I think that's the question is, can they get there and when? And I think that's what will be care. That's why I think this game will be very interesting Sunday at Denver because it's not, you know, Broncos have the Broncos run D 61 yards. I think they allowed against, against the Raiders. So, and someone, somebody up here, and I wanted to kind of get to this um, because I think it's important. And let me see if I can find the question about the run game. And now I can't find it. By the way, a lot of people are asking about Jacoby Brissett and the Jets. Why the hell would the why would the hell would this team trade Jacoby Brissett? So I let me pose let me pose something to you here on this, okay? This team's in on Hal, right? They are. Um, and what's Jacoby Brissett's long-term future here? I don't know. Do the Jets really have any real interest in him? I don't know that either, okay? And I don't know what they would actually offer to do so. And secondarily, I want to say this. Today, Charles Leno restructured a contract to right. free up some cap room. Do we know why yet? Do we... Do we are they intending to try to do some business now? I like I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So he makes a pretty good chunk of money that could be off of their books. Now, to your point, it is a massive risk to actually trade him because if Hal were to turn an ankle, makes, you're going to Jake Fromm. That's what's happening. And you know I love him. But it like, makes no yeah. sense. There, well, all. okay. So, but from that other perspective of If you're trying to free up cap room to do some business now, for whatever reason, here's an opportunity. Do you want to get an asset for a player who's probably or may not be here? He's not going to be at that price next year. Maybe you might think about it. And so I see a pathway to doing it with the understanding. And I mean a clear understanding with the ownership. If you did something like this, the risk that you're taking. by doing. Let me say this. The only way I'm doing is if the ownership says you are coming back next year. Because if something happens to Howell, you're done. So, like, correct. You know, it, 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 like, it has to be a clear understanding with the owner. Yeah, we are I, taking a massive, calculated risk by doing something like this. You've got to be on the, board with us if we are willing to do it. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't. I don't think it's. I don't think for that reason. I don't think it's going to happen either. But yeah. we know who their starting quarterback is, and that's not changing. You know, like it's, it's not changing. But no. there's a ton of value in Jacoby Brissett. I agree, and. 
So anyway, yeah. But anyway, so Colin Fletcher wants to know what's the deal with Cam Curl's contract? Are they going to extend him? Do they have the money now or will it happen at the end of the season? So a lot of that is still working through ownership stuff. You have to know one thing about that. They're very, very patient. They're not going to come out and just say, yeah, go ahead and do it. I think you need to go to them. And this is what they do is like, they are very big on being, you know, making presentations to them. When I've talked to people who've worked for them in Philly and New Jersey, and then people who deal with them here, like they're very big on the presentation aspect. So I only say that because a lot goes into this. It's not as simple as, Hey, we want to do this. Oh, okay, go ahead. There's a lot that they have going on. And it's like, there's still a long season. Now, if you're on the other side, you want it done because you don't want to take the chance of you want to get that extension done before in case we saw like, listen, Aaron Rodgers, you know, gets tears his killers out for the season. That happens all the time. So you want that security before you start playing. That's the ideal. But it, it but it's still it's been, it's been a very slow process. I'll say that. And unless something's happened in the last week to get it started, I don't think we're very far along in that. But I think the sides know what about where you need to get to. So, but I don't think, I don't think there's a whole lot, unless something has changed in the last week and that I haven't heard that, which is always possible. Yeah. I don't think, I, I don't think a deal that, well, one, the Jets have to want him. Two, they'd have to give up well, something. Talking, that, I was talking about Cam's contract, but like. Cam's, con- I Cam's contract? I, um, I don't expect anything like that to happen right now. Although, you know, I could see where, I, there, here's the weird part with him. So, and I hate talking about this stuff because they're one to know, and I want to give Rivera and his staff a chance to retain their jobs. Like if there's going to be a change at the end of the season, how does a new GM view Cam Crow? Would they see him the same way if there's going to be change over in staff? I think we all know that if, um, if Rivera and Jack Del Rio and everybody are coming back, you know, beyond this year, Cam Crow needs to be resigned. I mean, he might as well be the captain of the defense, quarterback of the defense. Like, of course he does. But I think that's why I think probably right. let's wait this thing yeah. out. And probably the ownership wants to wait this thing out. So let's see how it goes. You know, to everybody who thinks like it's a done deal that they're not, they're going to make a change at the end of the year. I, I don't think so. Like, I think we need to play this thing out and see what happens here. If they are right about uh, Sam Howe and if they have a good record and end up in the playoffs, then I think everything's on the table for the staff to completely return. And if that's going to be the case, then I think a priority will be to re-sign either Chase or Montez, if not both, and then obviously Cam Curl. There's a lot of other free agents left to talk about, but if they're not going to do that, and we're just a long way away from it, I don't know how a new regime would view him, honestly. So right. like, so that's that's the other part of this. Yeah, and I think, there, I think it just takes a little bit to get to that point. So, you know, I don't know, you know, I know they've mentioned how they'd like to extend, especially Montez. I mean, there's they know the value in Montez. I think Chase... I think that's a wait, a definite wait and see. I think if they could get Montez done now, they would. Um, with Chase, it's always going to be a wait and see. This episode is brought to you by FX's Welcome to Wrexham. Celebrity owners Rob McElhenney and Ryan Reynolds, small town Welsh football club, is fighting for a chance at promotion. These two Hollywood stars lead a team in the midst of history in the making, while dedicated staff and supporters hold on to a dream of returning the team and this working class town in Wales to glory. FX's Welcome to Wrexham premieres September 12th on FX. Stream on Hulu. Jewelry can say many things on your wedding day. As a wedding band, it can say, this is a forever symbol of our forever love. As a gift to your wedding party, it can say, thanks for standing up there with us. Blue Nile can help you find the piece that says it all and says it beautifully with expert guidance and a wide assortment of jewelry of the highest quality at the best price. Go to BlueNile.com and experience the convenience of shopping Blue Nile, the original online jeweler since 1999. That's BlueNile.com. Komodo King wants to know, how come the run game wasn't ever able to take off? And so, Bram, my little two cents on that. First of all, in the first half, I felt like they needed to run Brian Robinson a little bit more. It only had, what, three carries, I think it was, in the first half, something like that. They wasn't were throwing a past the run a little more early than I expected. Very much, and which is okay, yeah. but yeah. The, but – the you know to me what they were doing well was they were getting some light boxes and getting him going on five six yard runs just kind of staying ahead of the change which i think is important for a young quarterback i also felt like in the second half they went to a little bit more and there were times where like i said there were times where i just felt like this block was missed that block was missed at the second level right and so i think it prevented 
a couple of times some things from being much better. And then in the end, in the end, the last couple of drives, they were like you mentioned earlier, they went very conservative with the runs. And you're watching the Cardinals get nine guys in the box and then basically just attacking the line of scrimmage because they know what's coming. So, you know, there I thought like they had some good or some fine runs, but you're right, like they never had those explosive runs and that's what they're they going to have one over 10 yards no. i mean you know like that that's that's rare on the other side of this and this was the really good stat because we haven't seen a lot of this one they had five receivers with 10 plus yards per catch right that, oh, we haven't had that in a while five receivers with 10 plus yards per catch so they're able to stretch the field in the intermediate zone we didn't see any real deep shots being taken so except the one to terry that ended up in a pi and led towards the first touchdown um you know how did oh my god how did the the thing he's been doing in camp that i love about him frankly like because i don't think most guys do not move to their left as well as he does no, he did he escaped the pocket moved to his left threw back between four people and threw a touchdown pass i mean like these are the little things about him that I think has all of us really excited about him. As far as the run game goes, I think it's a mixture of things. One, I love Brian Robinson. I think he's a very good player. I don't think he's a home run here. It's not Brees Hall. Like, I don't, it's not going to, they don't have that type of running back. I think Gibson, uh, once upon a time, you know, was figured to potentially be that way, but I don't see the skill set and timing of, say, you take Gibson's speed and balance and put it into Robinson's know-how, and you have the running back that I think we're talking about here. Um, I love Robinson. I think he's a, I think I heard Chris Cooley say this once. He's a singles and doubles hitter. There's nothing wrong with that, like because no. he's consistent. Um, you're not going to get negative yardage with him. When you need tough yards, you get it. He's, he's a very reliable player, so I like him a lot. I don't think we have an explosive running. We didn't draft our Jameer Gibbs. Like, we don't oh, have and I'll tell you what. Player. Yeah. And this team liked Jameer Gibbs. And I think they were surprised and disappointed how early he went. Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think they definitely had their eye on him. Now, I don't know that they would have taken him at, at when they did, but um, I think that, that he was certainly, and you know why, because like he would have been a perfect style in this offense. And one of the things with the run game, the enemy comes from a system where they like to throw the ball. Andy Reid was always known for passing the ball in Philly and in Kansas city. And yeah. he's continued that. So that's where he's coming from. So that style of offense really is designed to have maybe a different style of back than, than what they, the way they, what they still would need. Cause I think he was, there's a still, a, there's a ton of value. I like Brian Robinson and I'm with you. Yeah. That's I like where, him a lot. Yes. Right. And that's where I think like there's sometimes they need those blocks to be hit, to give them a crease. Yeah. And if, you know, and sometimes as a running back, like when Alfred Morris was here, Alfred Morris was not a fast guy. Not, I mean, it's by running back standards, but he was so good at setting up blocks. Yeah. So good. Now, some of that had to do with the zone read, but some of that had to do with his patience. And then boom, like he would get those guys over, draw the linebacker here and then cut back. Yep. And that's where I think those RPOs, because that's just, again, it's one thing to run it in college. It's nothing to run it in the NFL. And just because you run it, you still have to make the right decision getting comfortable with it because there are times where like, okay, if you hand it off here, you're getting six, seven more yards. And the more you get of those, maybe the more you have a better chance for yeah. another game. I'm hoping a little bit with Robinson too, the more time he gets, the more reps he gets because he seems to thrive in contact, which is, you know, it's a good thing. Like he, like it's never negative yards. He's never going backwards. It's always falling forward. It's all of these things. And so like, I like that about him. And he like, clearly like watch the cuts he makes. Like he's a very, he's a very polished running back. The next level for him to me is what you're talking about. Like, can he like not lean into the contact as much when there's an opportunity to either set up a block or make one quick, one more secondary cut? Because if he gets to that point where it's not all about just the contact, because he's confidently will finish runs the right way. But if he could kind of, I, I would just say mature into becoming the NFL running back where the second cut becomes finding some more open space. I think you'll see more, of the 10 to 15 yard variety runs. He doesn't have the breakaway speed that I think allows him to have those home run hitting runs that we're kind and of looking for. Yeah. And that's where I think, and this is where, you know, if you, if the line can give help just a little bit more in the run game or the tight ends or whomever, the receiver sometimes getting to that second level, because there are a couple of times where it's like, ah, if you just get there, whatever. So Juan Quiros wants to know, will we see Jabril Cox promoted to the roster and playing anytime soon? I don't see it. He's a, he, listen, Dallas was okay. Letting him, seeing him go. 
So I would yeah. say that I like, I don't know, I but I will say off the game, um, you know, and I came out of camp, I was trying to be less concerned about the linebackers because of the talent around them in the secondary and the defensive line at the end of camp, I started to be worried again. And I'm, I'm less concerned about Jamin. Yeah. I'm not concerned day, about Jamin. I thought, I thought, I thought Cody Barton had a rough one of people. Yeah, I, who, I was, no, no, but it, th- this isn't like, what I'm saying is that first of all, there's two things about Cox. One, I know they liked him a lot coming out of college and I liked him too, but I don't think you're going to see him anytime soon necessarily. Cause first of all, you got to get used to the defense yeah. It takes these guys a minute, especially at that position. Um, but they signed Barton for a reason. I will say, I liked what I I thought Jamin Davis did a nice job, especially early on. There were a couple of plays, but I think Barton gets washed up a little bit in that traffic. And is that over and over, still, John? Yeah, over and, and over. right. And so is that is that a function of getting used to this defense, or is it just like this is who he is? I don't. We'll 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 find out. Yeah, but like, I, mean, I, I agree. Have to ask the coaches about it, but like right, right, all right. The, of the people, like Gibson, you know, Gibson had the fumble, and then I, I don't know why his workload went down from there. I'll have to ask the coaches why. Yeah, that's, play, that's yeah, that. On uh, on Barton, um, I thought he was the player that didn't play very well. You know, right? Like, no, or, I agree with that. He just yeah. there there wasn't yeah. anything where you say, oh, okay, I see that, and that, yeah. you know, um, so yeah, I I would agree with that. But I don't like I don't know that you can see a guy like Jabril Cox coming up anytime soon. I just don't know where he's at with anything to really think that, that, um, that he's ready for that. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, other people want to know, and I can't remember who had it up here, but they want to know, okay, do you think we're getting the whole story on chase young? So here's what I know. First of all, and I get, I've been asked, a lot of people have said this to me and Bram, I'm sure to you too, like, Oh, I'm tired of his injury drama. This is far different than last year. Last year was, we started hearing really early, too early, as it turned out, that, hey, maybe he might be coming back soon. And there was some level of optimism, even after about four or five weeks, that, hey, maybe it's soon. And that's what every, all the fans, we would say stuff, the fans would hear that. And so it just builds and builds and builds. And then you knew that eventually he was cleared. And then we had to wait because he had to then feel, he had to have the confidence in the knee, which I understand it's, it was a brutal injury, ACL and ruptured patellar tendon. This is different. This is a neck injury. He has not been, he was there for game contact. It was more like it was what they called it um, controlled contact. In other words, practice level contact. When you're cleared for uncontrolled contact or un, yeah, uncontrolled contact, that's a game level situation. So they wanted to see him ease into that. And it was like, because I know Rivera said on Friday, if he's cleared, he might play. And that was accurate. But there are levels to that clearing. I think they needed, they could have done a better job saying, listen, there are different scenarios involved here. It's not as simple as cleared than play. It's clear to what level. And I think that's yeah, something I, that- there were some games with ship there too. I was all right with it because I mean the Cardinals spent the week not saying who their starting quarterback is. So there's some why are we gonna ship, tell them but- whether our, our stud edge rusher is gonna play or not? Like, what's the point? So I wasn't really bothered by that. No, and I think, but I think like so is there more? It's it's a neck injury. That's yeah. what it is. And so you're I, going to be careful. He wasn't cleared. Yeah. He, I know in this case he wants to play. And I don't think this is like what I know from his standpoint, like, I don't think he'd rather, I think he'd just want to r- rather wait until after he plays before he talks to us again, yeah. because there's not much to say. I mean, and I, know, I think it's frustrating. I get it. I, I want to just one thing about this, like over the weekend, because of how vague the information was and they're right. not sharing what the, what the, what it is like, it's hard to know um, exactly what's going on, but I mean, it took till the end of the week to even be cleared for any context. So I want to tell you that like, this is not something that's minor. All right. So they're like, right. they're, they're taking their time. They want them to be healthy. Like I saw the reaction from some of the fans on social media and I know it's just some of the fans and they were just, it was, it was not right. Like what like the guy has a neck injury. Give him the benefit of the doubt, right? Give the team the benefit of the doubt. He wants to play. He needs to play. This is a career year for him. The team is trying to be careful with him and they don't want him to get hurt seriously again. Like slow down your judgments and the way that they were phrased really bothered me. Like he's hurt. Like let him heal. 
when he's ready to go, he will play. So I want to, you know, like, it's not the knee injury. It's a different injury. I'm frustrated. We're all frustrated by it. We want to see him play. I want to see him play healthy. That's all. Right. And yeah, and I think, yeah, exactly. So I am Jim says Forbes' break on the ball. He almost intercepted was just as impressive as Butler's near interception. I agree. That's something he does very well. Yeah. And the other thing, like the thing I always like about him is, and you saw this again, is how quick he gets to the ball when he's, when he's, when he knows where he's going and how quickly he can beat guys so he can avoid blocks and get, he got that tackle for loss, which is what we saw. And Kevin wants to know, do you think EB going so much to the pass was more a schematic thing? Or do you think he's trying to give Sam as many reps as he can to get him more comfortable at the starter role? I think this schematic. is what EB wants. Well, I, I think this was in this particular case, this will go yeah. back to, I had heard Gibson was going to end up playing a lot more than he did because I think they were going to throw the ball a ton. And he's the guy that they're trying to utilize as a JD McKissick type role for them or however you want to kind of define it. He was out there to be a receiver for them and carry the ball. It feels like that that changed after that fumble, but this is, this was this was not a preseason game. They went out there and this was their game plan, and that schematically they were going to throw the ball a lot early. Yeah, and so Marcus says Chase Young had an ACL and patellar tendon at the same time. I never heard that. Was reporting that all last year and talked yeah, yeah. about it on here too. So I'm sorry you didn't hear it, but that was out there and it has been out there. But it it was I'll say this like sometimes with these injuries too, people have to know like. Agents a lot of times will tell teams, I don't want you saying this or this or this. And we've seen that in other cases here, maybe even just in the last couple of years. Okay. Um, and with, in this case, but I know in this case, the patellar tendon, it kind of came out after the fact, after the initial injury yeah. it was a few months later, but I know I reported a lot last year. I know others did as well. And I talked about it. Um, but yeah, so it, but it was, it was bad. It was bad. And um, so that what a couple more here tackling overall felt really solid for week one. I agree. I think it's been like that since the preseason. I, I think they had a better camp in that regard. So, you know, I think that was, that's been a good thing. Um, Bram, what are you looking forward most to seeing on Sunday? Where do they, where's an, is there a one area you say they've got to be better here if they want to build on this? Uh, I mean, the one, I mean, I don't want to really say anything about the Broncos yet because I haven't seen him play. Right, so I want to, you know, I really want to take some time later in the week. And yeah, yeah. For this team, um, I, I do feel like I'd like to see Cody Barton, you know, I, I would hope in a short period of time, you know, play a little better. I mean, I play a little better is not the right word. Um, be, I, I don't even know. He's the one that concerned me yeah. really after the game. And I'd like to talk to the coaches about it before I really say anything else about it. But yeah, he was the I, one that felt, felt a little out of position at times. Um, yeah. the, you know, stopping run, stopping the run on the edge was a problem. The preseason, they had a couple early problems here. It didn't come back to bite them because that was not a team that was capable of very many explosive plays, but that remains something that I would keep an eye yeah. on. Um, and then offensively, I just think, I really think it's more like to sit there and go like, well, the offensive line is going to be dominant. I really don't think that's ever really going no, to happen. I don't think they, need to be, they need to be adequate. So right. I saw, and I'm, I'm not, I didn't not expect this because it was the first week in a real game and there's a lot of new pieces here there were some miscommunications if i'm denver and watched you know where the cardinals had some big time success and made some big time game changing type plays they confused them by putting six up on the line and they only had to bring four out of it but the washington offensive line was confused at who had who and it ended up being a couple of very big moments in the game and the other thing i would just say like i actually thought sam played really well I thought, you know, like I'll give him a B because, or maybe a B minus because he had a couple of, you know, the, the fumble's terrible. Like that, that could have lost them the game. But overall, um, I liked his feel for the game. I like the way he bounces back. Um, I, I would hope that, you know, in a couple of occasions that he gets rid of the ball a little bit faster. But you could probably say that about any quarterback in literally any game. Josh Allen last night, if you watched him, was ridiculous how loose he was with the ball. And oh, he was getting rid of the ball. The there was no yeah. doubt about right, that. Exactly. But that's and that's the thing with with Howell that some of these things it's a new offense and it's his second start. There's a yeah. lot going on for him that's going to take time. And like I know we talk about this and people everybody wants to see a high level of play right away so you can. But I think it's the key for him is just keep building on it and don't let you know just keep building. That's it. Yeah. And you know because each week you're going to see something different too. It's not like okay this week you were slow with the ball. Now, next week, you're not. 
you're going to see a different defense. So now you're going to have to read it a certain way. I think the key is like learning a few things, for example, the, the ball security or on some of those RPOs. If you see this and you, you cannot hesitate, you've got to let it go and stay with your, stay with your throw a little bit longer. Cause if he had, he had Deami Brown for six, it was wide, wide yeah. open. So yeah. like little things like that, that's going to take time. And you have to keep in mind that it takes time. With the line, it also they are there are new 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 stars at four spots. It also takes time. Yeah, it's gonna the take question time. is, can yeah. they get to a good enough level as a group to make this a a, a good offense? That that part would be. Mean, have to, they have if to there are it. two things, you know, it's funny, you know, like this is year four. If there are two things that have come to fruition each and every year, the line starts slow, and then suddenly they kind of find their way in the middle of the season, and the run fits are bad, and they find their way by the middle of the season. Right. What I'm hoping is, is that this team gets off to a better start and gets away with some wins here early, because if they go out to Denver, I hated that they lost the Raiders, by the way, because, I mean, just the rhythms of the league. Oh, and two at home is... Their offense player. didn't look good, Bram. No, I haven't seen it yet, but like, I'm just telling you, like, you know how this goes. Like, oh, I know how it goes. Yeah. Trust me, as much as we're looking at this schedule going, we might be 2 0 in Buffalo. You don't think they weren't looking at that schedule going, Raiders, Commanders at home to start the season were 2 0. Like, you don't think they were thinking that? No. So, of course, that loss, you know, the fact that they lost that game bothered me, you know, because it's just the rhythms of the league. They're going to be hearing it all week, how they have to win this game. So, we'll see how it goes. Um, But overall, I mean, listen, I mean, You know, that team is, no matter what, is going to be missing a lot of their weaponry. So, again, they're going to be, I think they're facing a much higher level quarterback, no matter what you feel about Russ. And I'll have to watch to see what it looked like. Right. I have to still watch it. But, like, they are missing a lot of their weapons. Like, I don't know if Jerry Judy's going to play. Tim Patrick got hurt. One of their starting tight, one of their tight ends got hurt. Like, they've had a lot of injuries here early. Jerry Judy, if he does play, will not be 100%. He's coming off a bad hamstring injury. So, it is set up for their defense again. Um, to have a good performance and you know just based off what I know of the way Denver played boy I'm going to be excited if we're coming back home to play Buffalo and this team hasn't given up one offensive touchdown in two weeks like that's a possibility like yeah by the way and we'll close on this because we can go to NFC Ant-Man we need someone to play like Micah Parsons (laughs) I I mean like okay we need someone to play like a possible defensive player there. <laughs> yes, they do. Everybody needs yeah. that. Everybody. Now, I will say he might be the best that, defensive player in the NFL. Like, I, 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 <laughs> and he is, he's a lot of he's a lot of fun to watch, man. Yeah. If you like, because he can move. He's smart. He can play a lot of places. And he says maybe Cox. No, Jabril Cox is not Micah Parsons. Jabril Cox was in Dallas. Keep in mind, and they they were okay letting him go. He's got he's got some work to do. But I do think he can fill a role here because I know they like him. So yeah. let's see where he goes in the future. But let's not let's not start thinking that he can be uh, Micah Parsons at this point. But everybody needs him. Dallas with a dominant opening win, and it is funny. And you know we're we're gonna wrap it up right here. But I will say, like in the NFC East, it's gonna be very interesting because Dallas and Philly. You know Dallas looked really good. Philly, I, I didn't watch that game, but I know Matt had pretty good numbers. And, and then these guys have to get, again, they have to play better, but you'd rather say that after a win than after a loss. So yeah, big week for them. Can they build on the momentum? Bram, thanks a lot for joining me. Thank you everybody for all the good questions. And I appreciate you tuning in. Always appreciate listening. Again, I have a film review on the sacks and Sam Hall up now. I'll be back on Thursday talking to Jeff Legwald, my ESPN counterpart, previewing the Broncos. So I'll talk to you next time.